Shalom, shalom from Jerusalem. Once again, this is day 11 of the war against the Iran-backed Hamas and the possible expansion into a forefront conflict here. Uh, we are speaking to you directly from Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. I'm Dan Dyker, uh, honored to be with you, president of the JCPA. I'm here with two distinguished colleagues and friends, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Maurice Hirsch, uh, international uh, lawyer, and uh, expert on all things uh, Palestinian, um, you know, one of the uh, our great commentators on the legal aspects uh, as well as uh, strategic aspects of, of Israel-Palestinian issues. He's in charge of the Palestinian Authority Accountability and Reform Initiative. And next to me is our distinguished guest for today, uh, a man that lead, needs little introduction, Khaled Abu Tuame who is a, a senior distinguished scholar at the Gatesone Institute and a, a senior fellow at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. Khaled is probably the greatest expert in the Middle East on the Palestinian Authority, on the Palestinians in general, and on the Hamas and their connection to the Iranian regime as well, uh, and other connections to radical Islamic movements. It's great to have you here today, Khaled. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We're in a very serious uh, situation. We've been in consultations all day. Above us, we're now on the ground floor of the JCPA, different offices than we were yesterday. Above us, uh, we have about 35 uh, uh, volunteers from IDF special units in the intelligence division in what they call the perception warfare, influence operations, cyber warfare. Uh, we are countering, we're leading the war outside the government against the intensifying Hamas, Iranian regime, disinformation propaganda campaign, which is in full force in the West, as you probably see, if you were, if you're looking at cyberspace, you're looking at, uh, you're looking at these uh, videos coming out of the West of people supporting the Hamas uh, massacre and ongoing uh, campaign uh, to try to uh, wound uh, Israel and the Jewish people. And we are just above on our ground floor uh, fighting that campaign by, by producing and loading uh, videos that are uh, really excellent one and a half, two minute videos. Halvin and I will be actually in the United States next week uh, giving presentations in California and New York. We'll tell you about that later. In the meantime, I'm just going to turn to Maurice, my dear colleague, just to give us a, the latest update. Uh, the numbers are uh, concerning. Uh, Maurice, where do we stand today? Day 11 of the conflict. Okay, Dan. So for day 11 of the, of, of the conflict, we're talking about numbers put out this morning at 2 a.m. Since then, there have been additions to some of them. We're talking about a, an attack of 3,000 terrorists on 30 different Israeli communities, cities, towns, kibbutzim along uh, um, the, the Gaza border. We're talking about the murder of over 1,400 Israelis, some foreigners, Jews, Arab Israelis, everyone was slaughtered irrespective and uh, indiscriminately. Um, we're talking about another 3,500 people who were injured, some of them still at the moment fighting for their lives um, in, in hospital. We're talking about another over 200 people who were abducted by Hamas. And that's an upgraded number. We had we were holding at 150 until this morning. Until yesterday, it was on 200 people. Now there are over 200 people. Of the hundreds of reports of missing people, there are only X amount of bodies that have been found. And so that number of 200 could actually go up there. Um, that's something which is obviously men, women, children, elderly, babies, babies, uh, uh, Sorry. Sick people, uh, everybody um, are being held uh, by the Hamas and other terrorists. Those groups holding the hostages include the PFLP. The Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Palestine, a member group of Mahmoud Abbas's PLR. Um, we're talking about as of this morning at 2 a.m., again, during the day, there's been a constant barrage of rockets being fired, but already by 2 a.m. this morning, there have been more than 6,930 missiles shot wow. at Israel, rockets shot at Israel. We're talking about 600, almost 700 rockets every single day. Those rockets have targeted all of Israel's um, biggest civilian populations. Jerusalem, as we saw in the briefing yesterday, where we ourselves had to suddenly run to uh, the bomb shelters. Um, Tel Aviv, Herzliya, Netanya, uh, um, all of the coasts, Rishon and Ashkelon, 
hundreds and thousands while the world obsesses about the Palestinian civilians who are moving south to avoid uh, in, in um, Gaza in, in Gaza in are moving south to avoid the the idea of attacks some of them being stopped by Hamas there are hundreds of thousands of Israelis who are living day to day moving around in hotels being hosted by by, by other families around Israel living in in in, in sports centers completely homeless now their homes were burned destroyed or under constant attack and that's just in the south when you add on what's going in in the north just before we started the briefing um, there was a new report that Hezbollah has now started and is well on the way to mobilizing all of its attack forces we could potentially be seeing another assault by another genocidal uh, uh, um, Islamic group on Israel's north, accompanied with, let's just put it into context, Hamas are evil, Hamas are exceptionally dangerous, but when compared to Hezbollah and the capabilities of Hezbollah, that's just another very lethal step uh, uh, upwards. Much of Israel's northern communities have already, already been sent to bomb shelters or evacuated. Um, that's our situation at the moment, um, a, a pretty dire uh, situation. Let me, let me just uh, contextualize one point that uh, Maurice has made here. One is that the, the psychological war, the psychological, political, perceptual war is playing a very important role in this overall conflict. The more that Hamas sends rockets northward, the, the greater the number of Israelis that are driven below into the basement because the IDF and our security forces do not know what the effect is. The longer the range of the rocket, the greater the breadth of the psychological terror. Let because me... it's more difficult to identify where the rocket will land so that more areas, more cities, more greater number of towns and much greater population have to go underground just because of the uh, the, the arc of the rockets being fired. Let me just context contextualize that for, for just one second, focusing on one group of the population. Um, we have a UN organization called UNICEF that defends children around the world. Um, this organization, I follow them closely for the last 10 years. They are entirely obsessing about the effect of the war on the Palestinian children, on the Gazan children. That apart from a mealy mouth condemnation five days ago, they have said nothing about the abducted Israeli children. They have said nothing about the fact that there are two million Israeli children who, since this war started, are at home. My children, the ones that aren't in the army, are at home. There is no school. Two million children for a week not going to school. Now, UNICEF obsesses on the fact that the Palestinian children are in danger. Our children are in no less danger as the genocidal uh, 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 terrorist groups from both Gaza and potentially from Lebanon focus and indiscriminately attack, attack our civilians, including all of our children. All right, there we have it. I mean, obviously, we're at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. We care for all children unquestionably. Yeah, I think the point... Uh, that uh, Maurice is making here is that there is a traditional default position of international organizations that very quickly uh, shift from having fashioned Israel as the, the victims of this unprecedented mass murder of Jews in one day to becoming all, you know, all of a sudden the default position is that the Jews, you know, the Israelis are, are the heavy, the Israelis are the oppressors, and that's been the traditional frame for every, for every conflict that, that, that Israel has had fighting radical Islamic uh, a terror. And that's, I think that's where you're pointing and out. As if there's no impact on Israel, Israel's population and, and, and our children, it's just a one-sided, according to the, the UN organizations, a one-sided onslaught of Israel against the poor victim uh, 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 Palestinians. Whilst Israel is enjoying a, a, a beautiful day, our children are going about their daily business. That's simply not true. Businesses are closed. People are losing hundreds of millions of dollars every single day. Children are missing their education. Children are being targeted, and that's being ignored by most of the UN organizations. Well, another thing that's being ignored by the UN and 
larger uh, discourses in the international community has to do with what is going to happen in Gaza as Israel now prepares for a major uh, ground incursion in order to decapitate uh, and collapse the, uh, the, Hamas, uh, the Hamas Iranian regime leadership there. Because what we know, as we'll hear from Khalid now, what the Hamas is essentially in Gaza has become a forward base for the Iranian regime. It's been that way for, for years. And the question that we put in the invitation uh, in consultation with Khalid is, what it does the PA, the role that the Palestinian Authority plays here, it is being perceived as the moderate player, perceived as the internationally diplomatically legitimate player. Holland is, uh, without pulling punches, the reigning expert on the Palestinian Authority, on the PLO, on the Fatah, and on the Hamas. Holland, let's turn it over to you. The question we asked in the invitation was, is what is the prospect of the PA playing ball with the international community, coming back into Gaza, retaking, reassuming the administration of Gaza. All of this had been, you know, sort of American and the American alliance model for what Gaza had been before 2005 and for what many in the West think Gaza could be after this, uh, this de expected decapitation uh, and collapse of the Hamas uh, leadership. Khaled, you're, the, the floor is yours. Well, I think, Dan, we cannot really talk about this uh, issue, the issue of who will control Gaza before you remove Hamas from power. As long as Hamas is there, uh, I don't see the Palestinian Authority or any other party that can really uh, move in to fill the gap. So a lot depends on what Israel does in the next few days, in the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. Now, it's very important to note, Hamas has been there for a long time. Hamas has been there when the Palestinian Authority was established in 1993 or 1994 after the signing of the Oslo Accords. Hamas grew under Yasser Arafat and later under President Mahmoud Abbas. Both of them, both Yasser Arafat and Mahmoud Abbas were unable to stop Hamas. I don't know if they were, if they had the will to do it also, but we saw that many of the attacks against Israel, the suicide bombings, and what happened during the second intifada, they happened while the Palestinian Authority was still in Gaza. Uh, that's a good point. We did see at the beginning of under Yasser Arafat, we did see some measures that the Palestinian security forces took against Hamas, but they were not enough. They were insufficient. We actually saw the revolving door. We saw them arrest some of the leaders of Hamas only to be released days later. Uh, now, when Mahmoud Abbas came to power, he followed the policy of Yasser Arafat, which was to try and live with Hamas, to try to uh, allow Hamas to operate while pretending that he is in control. President Abbas was not able and did not want to stop the rocket attacks. He did not want to launch a massive uh, campaign against Hamas. In the end, Hamas managed to overthrow uh, his regime. They kicked him out of Gaza. They, uh, they killed hundreds of uh, Palestinian Authority officers. They killed hundreds of Fatah people. I was down there in Gaza back then in 2007. We saw what happened. Hamas woke up one morning and kicked the Palestinian Authority out of Gaza after throwing many of them from the rooftops, after dragging some of their members to the streets and lynching them. It was all set. So now, the question is, OK, let's say that in two or three weeks from now, uh, Hamas is removed. Although I don't know what, it, what, what does it really mean to remove Hamas? You can remove 10,000, 20,000 people. You can remove Hamas as institutions, as individuals. But Hamas is also an ideology. Hamas is deeply rooted over there. Uh, I look at the Palestinian Authority situation today, and I ask myself, I mean, they are sitting in the West Bank. If they are not able to control the lion's den uh, and the Jini battalion and the uh, other groups, the these are Iranian regime-backed groups, by the way, operating operating under in areas that are controlled by the Palestinian Authority. In theory, yeah. no, 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 because they backed off, they run away. Yeah, but the Palestinian security forces are in charge of Jini, they are in charge of Nablus, they are in charge of yes, Balata Rifi, Quartas, Quartas. 
They're, they're sitting there, yeah. but I don't see them trying to disarm these That's groups. I don't see them trying to arrest these groups. So if the Palestinian Authority has failed in the West Bank, as we have seen in the past two years, they have not been able to stop any of the terrorist attacks against Israelis. They have not been able to stop any of these uh, or uh, arrest any of these uh, armed groups that have popped up over there. How can one really expect them to come to uh, Gaza and enforce law and order over there or try to do something? Now, President Abbas is now 88 years old. Probably by the time uh, Abbas, uh, by the time you know Hamas is gone, I'm not sure Abbas will be around. So th there's another question over here. Will any of these Palestinian leaders who are sitting there and who might uh, replace or succeed Abu Mazen, will they be able to uh, do what you know to do the job in Gaza? Will be will they be able to come to Gaza? That's another question that needs to be asked. Who will be in Gaza? So I, under the current circumstances, I just don't see how the Palestinian Authority, which has failed in, in the past in uh, enforcing law and order in Gaza and reigning in all these terrorist groups and preventing Hamas and Islamic Jihad from carrying out terrorist attacks, and that has failed also in the West Bank, I don't see how you can rely on them in, the, uh, in Gaza. There's another one final point I'd like to make. Let's say you move the Palestinian security forces to the to Gaza and you arm another 50, 60,000 uh, police officers and you put them over there. What guarantees do you have that they will not be infiltrated by Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad loyalists over there? So these are very serious questions. So if Israel goes in and removes Hamas from power, I'm not sure that without you know some kind of an international arrangement or uh, any 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 Palestinian party would be able to go there and uh, take over. Uh, Khaled, there are how many active Hamas operatives are there in the Gaza Strip? Thirty or forty thousand? Uh, Twenty, thirty thousand? You know, then it, what do you mean by operative? Well, there are those on the on the Hamas security forces. Hamas dominates Gaza, controls its government, controls all of the services. I mean, it's essentially Hamastan. It's essentially yes. a de facto sovereign state controlled by this Iranian-backed terror organization that controls all the social services, all the government services, the security forces, uh, and everything in between. And the, que the, the question really comes up, as you've seen, there's been not a little bit of, uh, 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 of rev I wouldn't say revolution, but opposition within the Gaza body politic, within the public, actually demonstrating, protesting against the severe lack of human rights in Gaza because of Hamas uh, and their Iranian backers. How much is the public really uh, uh, you know, desiring to be free and actually desiring to have the Israeli Defense Forces come back and save them from their own Hamas oppressors? Look, Dan, there is no doubt that there are many Palestinians in Gaza who are unhappy with Hamas, who are opposed to Hamas, who are yearning for the day that Hamas will be removed from power. Of course, these people cannot speak right now because Hamas's popularity has uh, skyrocketed since this attack. They are now seen as the heroes in quotes who managed to invade Israel, kill many Israelis, uh, imprison many Israelis, capture them and return them, hold them hostage in Gaza. So the situation right now is that Hamas is riding the uh, popularity uh, uh, you know, wave, wave, wave. Yeah. and under the current circumstances, it's very difficult for people to speak out against Hamas. It's easy for me to sit here in Jerusalem and say, you know, I'm opposed to Hamas and I condemn Hamas, but many people are afraid to speak. Uh, but um, at the end of the day, the last thing that President Mahmoud Abbas would want is to be portrayed as someone who is returning to Gaza uh, on top of an Israeli tank. Uh, he does not want that image. You know, I, I'm not even sure that President Abbas in the past 10, 15 years since he was kicked out of Gaza really wanted to go back to mm -hmm. Gaza. He sees the situation over there. He sees that Iran is there. He sees that uh, Hamas is in control. He sees that Islamic Jihad. He sees all these groups. He, I mean, who, who would want to assume responsibility over a place like that? It's uh, very difficult. On top of this, Whoever uh, go, you know, assumes control of Gaza will also be in charge of the effort to rebuild Gaza. And the question again is, is the Palestinian Authority able to do that? 
Will they? Will the Palestinians over there in Gaza co cooperate with them? Will the international community help them? These are many questions that uh, will be asked in time. Yeah, yeah, very serious. Yeah. So, so I wanted to just weigh in on, on, on two things that Dan, with your permission. Firstly, I think it's a mistake to to refer to Hamas as 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 many of the the, the international um, organizations do as just the de facto uh, controllers of the Gaza Strip. It has to be remembered at the behest of, at the demand of Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian Authority, Hamas participated in the last elections in the PA in 2006. They won those elections, hands down, outright majority, both in Gaza and even in Ramallah, the stronghold of, of Fatah. I totally agree. Until last June, he was still trying to forge a unity government of Hamas. He met with them he in, in Cairo. In Cairo, Abbas went to meet with Hamas just weeks before. And, and while they were planning this genocidal assault um, on Israel, Hamas, between Hamas and Fatah, there isn't, as they say, between the Israeli and the American uh, policies, there isn't any daylight as, the, as, as regards their ideological drive to destroy Israel. Now, you asked about the number of Hamas operatives, terrorists, call them as, as, as you may. You have to remember, Dan, Hamas has been in charge of the Gaza Strip since the summer of 2007, when, as Khalid described it, they took the Fatah people and threw them off the tops of roofs. They are the biggest and largest employer in Gaza. They have, at least by the, the numbers, that, the last numbers that I saw, on their payroll, somewhere in the region of 100,000 people. This means all of, their, all of their security apparatus, which, as we've seen, is both large and very, very forceful, that is well armed. They have all of the, uh, uh, the missiles. I don't know if anyone has seen the pictures of the, the vast amount of weapons that were seized on the bodies of the dead terrorists. I, we're talking about RPGs, uh, rocket launchers that were carried with the terrorists into Israel. We're talking about a, a massive, massive mechanism which has to be destroyed in its entirety from, from the first uh, um, uh, alliance until the last of the senior commanders, including Yahya Simbar and, and the rest, Mohammed Def and, and, and that whole aguardia of, of leaders as Israel has been uh, uh, rightly uh, attacking in the last few days. In the situation, in a situation uh, where there is a, a real strategic shift and a total collapse, destruction of the Hamas leadership, would would a over would an overwhelming military victory by Israel not signal to the Palestinian public in Gaza that there's a new reality on the ground and they, they would not automatically try to reconstitute Palestinian Islamic Jihad, other Salafi cells, or Hamas, uh, you know, in a different uh, constellation. I think then in order for that to take place. Uh, Israel would have to stay for quite a while, for some time inside Gaza. You can't just carry out an operation and uh, for a week or two and then leave. Yeah. It's a long-term process. Uh, Palestinians need to see the change on the ground. They need to see that Israel is serious. But if you carry out short-term uh, operations in Gaza, that, you know, the, the last Hamas guy will uh, appear from the tunnel and he will celebrate victory. You haven't achieved anything. As long as there's one person over there, it's one Hamas official, one Hamas uh, member uh, who will hold the flag and flash the V sign for victory, we're still in trouble. People need to see that, you know, uh, that this military operation, this, uh, that the IDF is really serious about changing the reality on the ground, uh, about uprooting Hamas from there. And, and, you know, again, we need to wait and see how things, uh, a lot depends on what Israel does in the next few weeks. Yeah, so let me, let me go to a couple, just go to a couple of questions here. There, um, uh, Ambassador Alan Baker, who is a distinguished uh, a fellow here at Jerusalem Center and directs our contemporary affairs and our, our legal, uh, our, our legal uh, rights initiative here, he, he asked, uh, what's the International Red Cross doing to help release the hostages as Israel requested their involvement pursuant to their humanitarian task? 
a sit down the Geneva Convention. That's actually a question for Ambassador Baker himself. I can answer that. But, but I was, Maurice I, can answer that. I, I, I was just looking at it. I, I, I can't tell you what Israel exactly has or hasn't done with the, 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 the International Red Cross. From my period, period, previous experience, I can tell you that the discussions between Israel and, and, and the Red Cross are pretty much confidential. Um, what I can, however, say is that a public statement released by the Red Cross just hours ago condemned Israel's movements in the Gaza Strip. Nothing about their responsibility um, to restore and to bring back the hostages. Nothing about the fact that Hamas is indiscriminately attacking Israel and has murdered people. That they, de they are denouncing and condemning Israel's response to that massacre. That I think is 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 a, is a terrible stain on uh, uh, the International Red Cross. And I would only hope that, similar to UNRWA yesterday, who published the fact that they that the Hamas terrorists had stolen fuel and then they deleted and, it. and then deleted it. I would hope that that the ICRC would have the common decency um, to at least remove that despicable uh, 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 statement. And, and at least they'll just be called out for it, yeah. but it wouldn't remain for eternity no. on, uh, on, on their website. You know, Moni's talking about deleting posts. It reminds me of what President Mahmoud Abbas did yesterday, where yeah. first he released a statement, uh, I wouldn't say condemning, but saying Hamas does not represent the Palestinians. And hours later, I saw that statement changed and saying, you know, all oh, the yeah. PLOs, these representatives of the Palestinians and no other faction. So here's a Palestinian president who was unable to condemn Hamas, who can't even mention Hamas in an official statement. And we are sitting here and talking about whether he can go back to Gaza and control Gaza. Well, this has exactly been the problem with the school of thought of the US-led Western Alliance. They, they talk with Israel and they talk among themselves in, in, a, in, in their own echo chamber. Nobody has talked about what Palestinian leadership uh, in the PA, whether it's Mahmoud Abbas or anyone else, would even be willing to consider such a move. And this is this has defined and characterized the mistake of Western policy in the Middle East for decades. And this is why there is an opportunity now, if Israel takes the opportunity, to change that misconception. It has been massacred, and it's up to Israel. And I think what Ambassador Baker is suggesting through his uh, well-crafted questions is actually a narrative that Israel has not put the feet, has not put the International Criminal Court's feet to the fire. They have not put the UN's feet to the fire. They have not put the feet to the fire of international human rights organizations. And that is a major mistake because it allows the narrative to be kidnapped and held hostage by the, uh, the far more sophisticated Palestinian Authority affiliates in the West and the international community. And as you know, Dan, while as we sit here uh, um, on the broadcast today, our own uh, uh, Daniel Levine is working on putting out a call from the JCPA, also to Israel's government, to not ignore the fact that Mahmoud Abbas has not condemned the, the, the massacre. It cannot be that he doesn't condemn the massacre, that he's about to pay millions of dollars to the, to the people who raped, pillaged, gassed, burned alive, uh, uh, decapitated babies, Mahmoud Abbas is going to pay them a reward. So explain to the and audience he, what that is. That's, that's, that's the Palestinian That's Kabbalah. all part of uh, uh, um, Mahmoud Abbas's pay for slave policy, how he rewards an institutionalized, entrenched in law system that sees the Palestinian Authority reward every terrorist, whether They've been arrested by Israel, and Israel is holding a hundred of these uh, terrorists, about a hundred of these terrorists who participated in the massacre. They are now being prosecuted. Mahmoud Abbas is going to pay them a huge salary. He's also going to pay a reward to the families of the dead terrorists, those terrorists who raped, pillaged, murdered, slaughtered. He's also been paying all of this time, Dan, um, salaries to the terrorists in Gaza, some of them were released in the, in the deal to release Gilad Shalit. People like Ali Kaadi. Ali Kaadi butchered his Jewish employer, Sassan Nouriel, in 2005. He was sentenced to life in prison. I happened to be part of the prosecution at the time. And uh, um, he was released in 2011. Since then, Mahmoud Abbas has been paying him a monthly salary. Ali Kaadi, thanks to Abbas, didn't have to work. 
He didn't have to do anything. He had a greater salary than, than 99% of the other Gazans flowing his, into his bank account every single month, a stable income. It allowed him to be the head of the uh, Nukba forces, the, the, the Hamas commando unit that controlled the central area of the Gaza Strip. That's what he was doing. And all that thanks to Mahmoud Abbas and his pay for slave policy. Most of the money, now this is the catch down, 70% of the income that the Palestinian Authority has from taxes comes from, comes Israel. from Israel. Israel's government every single month gives the Palestinian Authority for the, on average, for the last eight months or for the first eight months of the year, uh, January through August, 794 million shekel a month. Yeah. That's about 250, 250 million dollars a month. That money goes to inciting terrorism, inciting the murder of Jews, um, rewarding the terrorists. If, of every hundred shekel that Mahmoud Abbas pays to someone who murdered, butchered, slaughtered, raped, decapitated Israeli babies, Israel gives him 70 shekels, 70 percent. And so our call is also to the Israeli government to to present a bus with an ultimatum. You have two weeks now until the end of the month when the money is transferred. Either condemn Hamas, stop immediately the payments to the terrorists, or Israel will cease giving you the money to continue rewarding the murderers of our children, brothers, sisters, parents, Grandparents. Okay, Khaled, what, do you, what, Khaled, what do you think about Maurice's? What, what do you think about this this notion of putting putting uh, the uh, uh, Mahmoud Abbas's feet to the fire? Yeah, look, Mahmoud Abbas has been playing a double game for a long time. He, it's time for him to decide whose side are you on. Are you on the side of peace and nonviolence, or are you on the side of Hamas and Iran and Islamic Jihad? In the past. Let me correct you, President Mahmoud Abbas did condemn Hamas. For what? For attacking the Hamas people, for the yeah, Fatah yeah. people. Absolutely. Not only that, but he even imposed sanctions on Hamas. In 2018, President Mahmoud Abbas showed that when he wants, he can operate against Hamas. When, when people talk about the electricity and, and Israel stopping the electricity to Gaza in 2018, yeah. Abbas stopped paying the electricity bill, which cut the flow of electricity from 12 hours to four hours a day. So it's time for him, if he wants to be a real leader, I think this is the time for him to prove that he is a real and brave leader. He should stand up and stop talking, you know, in ambiguous and unclear terms. He should openly say, I condemn what Hamas did. It has brought tragedy on both Jews and Arabs. Hamas is destroying the Gaza Strip. The Nakba that President Abbas is talking about right now in Gaza is a direct result of Hamas's atrocities, Hamas's actions. And this is the kind of statement I would like to hear from him or from any senior Palestinian official. So far, we don't hear that. Yeah, we're not it. hearing it. At least we're, 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 Abbas Zaki, a senior uh, um, uh, Fatah member, went the, the other way. He congratulated Hamas for their successful operation. That is the, 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 the direction that, that Fatah, Mahmoud Abbas's party, is taking. Yes. But this is also, gentlemen, why we're facing a, an upcoming period of unprecedented instability, because the Hezbollah, which are the proxies in the north that are controlled, financed, directed, and inspired by the Iranian regime in Tehran, are waiting, crouching. This is classic Islamic warfare, if it is not. And to swarm once Israel is deeply ensconced in Gaza with tens of thousands of, of troops. And then they will make the decision, uh, uh, according to the mullahs, according to Ali Khamenei, according to the head of the IRGC, to attack Israel from the north. Your sense, Khaled, about, about this evolving war. It's a rolling war, which could very easily end up in a war against the, the Iranian regime itself. Yeah, look, there's no doubt that from day one, Hamas has been trying to drag Iran and Hezbollah and other Arabs and other Muslims into this uh, war. And so far, thank God, they have not been very successful uh, or their success has been very limited. What we saw in Lebanon, you know, these sporadic attacks and uh, 
They're very limited in the meantime. They haven't blown into a full-scale uh, war. But this is what Hamas is working on right now. They, it's called the unity of the uh, battlefields. Uh, they have been talking about this for the past two and three years. That's they right. need to unite all the fronts against Israel. And when they are talking about uniting the fronts, they're saying, we want to attack Israel from Gaza. We want to attack Israel from the West Bank. We want to attack Israel from East Jerusalem. We want to attack Israel from the north, from Lebanon, and even from Syria. And this is, you know, this is the plan. Uh, this is what they are hoping to achieve right now. And I, again, I said a lot depends on what Israel does, but it also a lot depends on how strong the international community will stand this time against Hamas. Uh, Israel's actions or military actions are not enough if they are not backed by international legitimacy. Right. You need That's the international right. community to openly and publicly say Hamas is finished. We need, we cannot. Israel cannot. Uh, coexist or have on its, you know, as its neighbor, a, a, a regime like that. The stance should be similar to the one that the international community took against ISIS. How do we, uh, we should answer uh, at least Gor uh, Gorson's question. The more we keep exposing the connection proof of the, uh, of the relations and connection between PA and Hamas, the more the White House cuts off uh, uh, because Biden, Biden wants to preserve a path to the Palestinian state. We've even made the argument that many Arab states are not stable. So state is no answer. They all fall on uh, deaf ears. So the question is now, you know, now what? It seems, we're talking back to the question about the day after. Khaled, you and I have talked, and Maurice, we, we've all talked about a pathway towards a federal confederal arrangement, which is actually what King Hussein uh, of Jordan talked about when he act, not he talked about it, he approved it back in 1985, 19, it was approved by the, it was approved by the PLO in 1985. And it was, uh, it was called, uh, they, they called it in a way the Jordanian option, which was, uh, uh, which was killed or, or the London conference anyway, back in 1987, it was killed, uh, by the Israeli, by Shamir actually in the Israeli, uh, unity government with Shimon Peres. But there was this idea and it's always, it's been floating around of having in Gaza a national security relationship and responsibility for Gaza between local Gazans, Egypt on the one hand, Israel on the other, and a mirror and a copy paste in Judea and Samaria uh, between Jordan and Israel with a Palestinian entity in the middle. Is is there is there any reasonableness to this idea? I think it's uh, premature to talk about this idea, if not unrealistic, by the way. I mean, we look at the response of Egypt and Jordan to what is happening in Gaza, and their biggest fear is of refugees flooding or entering their areas. Instead of helping these people in Gaza, they're just, you know, warning that, oh, we will not receive them, we don't want them, the Egyptians have sealed the border, King Abdullah of Jordan is uh, crying and shouting, and, you know, I don't want uh, more people here, We're not, we don't want refugees, a warning of a displacement of Palestinians because he is also afraid. So if they are afraid to help the Palestinians and absorb them uh, or open their borders, even, do you think that they really want to have any kind of uh, relationship with these Palestinians? It doesn't look like that. Yeah, Chris, you know, there's a total abdication of responsibility by the Arab world, including, for example, uh, um, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, who was really just a days away from signing according to what we understand, signing a normalization agreement with Israel, which is what sparked, what triggered the Iranian regime to, to uh, mobilize the Hamas now and carry out this massacre now in order to, to, to try to really uh, destroy that uh, possible relationship. But on the other hand, you don't see anyone even in the Arab world, even Jordan, Egypt, and others in the Abraham Accord countries. I mean, you do see, you have seen support from the Bahrainis, the Emiratis. You have seen that uh, rhetorically. But people are not stepping up to help the Palestinians. And yeah, other than lip service, they're not offering them any real uh, solution. We have a lot of questions here uh, from our, our, our audience. We want to take a couple of them are anonymous, but they're interesting. Uh, uh, one, one question that came through an anonymous attendee is that what, why does it, Israel even maintain the PA given the response to Hamas atrocities? Wouldn't, be, uh, wouldn't it be a better option upon the destruction of Hamas to take the PA down and allow for new elections, it's a very far-reaching comment, you know, and it touches on 
conversation we had. Because in Israel, there are still <clears throat> many people who are, you know, who continue to see the Palestinian Authority as a partner. And the concept or the idea in this, or the assumption in Israel is that if you bring down the Palestinian Authority, then you will have to start collecting the garbage in Ramallah and uh, providing the Palestinians with employment. And we, Israel, don't want to do that. So, uh, so that's one of the reasons why, you know, uh, the Palestinian Authority is still there. It's interesting, Manuel. Uh, your last name, Manuel, is uh, Prutsi. Uh, he asked the question, yeah, but, but Biden is meeting with Abbas. Will, the, will, will uh, President Biden press Abbas to do what Khalid has been raising? I think the answer is no, because they're, the, the Americans and the Israelis are not aligned on what's happening in Gaza. As much as they say, you know, President Biden is on his way, you have massive amount of, of American heart, yeah. uh, 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 military power in in and around Israel now, but they're not. We're not aligned with the United States. Right? I don't even understand why is President Biden meeting with Abu Mazen. Yeah, Abu Mazen is totally irrelevant. What's he going to do? When, if when, I were the Americans, on the other hand, I would demand that Abu Mazen stop the incitement, uh, stop the uh, you know the calls for. I mean, the, the messages coming out of the Palestinian Authority are radicalizing Palestinians. One of the reasons why Hamas and Palestinian and Islamic Jihad are very popular is because of the rhetoric of the Palestinian Authority. This is not new, by the way. It's been oh, going on for a long yeah, time. We've been writing about this for de decades. The Palestinian Authority, by radicalizing its people against Israel, has driven many Palestinians into the open arms of Hamas and Palestinian and Islamic Jihad. So I don't know what you know. What more can or well, why is the President Abbas being invited to this meeting? I mean, it's totally irrelevant unless you want to bang on the table and demand that, you know, he change the tone, he change the rhetoric, he stop the uh, indoctrination, he stop the incitement, things like that. When, like I said yesterday, uh, when the American embassies described the conversation between President Biden and Mahmoud Abbas, they said, President Biden condemned the attacks and, and President Biden said, this isn't the way of the Palestinian people. Mahmoud Abbas said nothing of the kind. He is, unless he comes out vocally in Arabic, Dan, not just in English to the international community, but in Arabic to the Palestinian people to say, I condemn these murders. This is not acceptable. This is not what we do. I am not going to continue rewarding terrorists. If he isn't capable and willing to do that, he is no less a part of the problem and zero part of the solution. And so when President Biden meets with him at any stage that he meets with him, that should be the opening part of the discussion. Either you're willing to align yourself with Western decent civilization, or you are aligned with the ISIS genocidal terrorists. There is no, there is no middle ground here. You cannot sit on the fence. The you know, same terrorists who want to kill Abu Mazen. Of course. Yes, because for them, he's a traitor. You know, uh, uh, Moshe, uh, Moshe Adia Alon, our former chief staff defense minister, once had, has said for, in a JCPA publication, Abbas's weakness is his strength. He knows that if he cries weak, if he cries victim to the United States, they will support him. And that's what he does. He always talks about his victim, being a victim, about being weak, about not being, you know, if Israel is not able to protect Israel, against the Hamas. What do you expect of the Palestinian Authority? Yeah, well, why can't Abu Mazen, as the president of the Palestinians, why can't he address the Palestinians on Palestine TV? He, he, because they, exactly for the reasons that you've talked okay. about for years, because so, he doesn't want to take a position that would threaten. Hey, yeah, but now, now the situation has changed. It's time now for taking positions. You can't continue with this policy of sitting on the fence. You're either the president or you're not the president. You can't say I'm the president of the Palestinians, but you know I'm not really in charge, and I don't. That's no, right. it, it doesn't work like that. By the way, that's uh, to our to the you know, over fifty uh, friends, family, and colleagues on the, on this call. Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs is starting and has established already, uh, together with Khalid and a number of our other Arabic experts, the first ever communication center in Arabic. Uh, at the JCPA, and we're expanding it now. We're also doing one in Farsi, and one, in, and we're having it in the same uh, communication center in English. These messages that you're asking about, in these wonderful questions that you're sending, and the and the discourse we're having here, will be a mainstay of the Arabic communication center. These questions and and uh, challenges will be posed 
to the Palestinian leadership, messages and, and content to the Palestinian public. We want to set the counter disinformation agenda here at JCPA, what the, what the uh, Israeli uh, governments have not been prepared to do. We are not tethered. We are not limited. We are not constrained here at JCPA. And we are going to take a lead in countering all of this uh, very problematic uh, uh, narrative and this uh, uh, psychological warfare, this perception warfare. Uh, and I, this is exactly uh, one of the areas in which we are outstanding. We, we have, also want them to, if I may, to engage Arabs and Muslims, that's right, Palestinians, because to be fair, there are many, or I do hear, a large number of Arabs and Muslims who are not happy with what Hamas is doing, right. but they don't right. have a platform. That's they a very important point. Uh, they, I want you to emphasize that point because that's the positive side of what we're doing. Yeah. You know what? People tell me, oh, it's a small, you know, a small minority. And what, what, what's wrong? Two people, 10 people, they will grow. But let's start. And that's why we want to give these people a platform. We want to engage them. I hear from some Arabs in private who are sharing the same messages that we are talking about, who are saying Hamas has brought disaster on us, Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood have failed wherever they have ruled, and, you know, the, and, and, you know, so th this is why I'm saying it's very important that we, through this media center, reach out to Arabs, reach out to Palestinians, who are potential partners for this. And once they see that this is growing, you'll have a, a, a larger number of people speaking out. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what we want to ask your support. If you could help us, we're completely privately uh, funded. And we, right now, our focus is in raising uh, the necessary funds for this uh, for the center. We've raised about 30% of the money. We've got to get to a couple million dollars to really uh, to really build out, bolster the network and all of the, we have many Arab journalists working, you know, in our international uh, network around the Arab world. Khaled is 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 uh, going to be spearheading a lot of what happens here at the Jerusalem Center, and we have other Arabic experts that will be constantly in discussion with our Arab neighbors, with our Palestinian neighbors, with the Israeli Arab uh, uh, public in Arabic. This is a new morning for this type of very positive uh, uh, narrative that, and, and discussion that we will establish the rules of that game uh, on the basis of the fact that Israel is an indigenous member of an Arab Muslim majority Middle East, but we've already had very important feedback from Arab neighbors, including many that don't have relations with Israel, uh, that they are waiting for this uh, new dialogue uh, in Arabic, and they recognize now, after many meetings we've had over the last months, that well over 50% of Israelis, including myself, uh, are married and have families that come from Arab lands. So that's a new positioning. Uh, or it's a re it's a repositioning, if you will, of, of Israel's indigenous profile here in the Middle East. So we when we talk about the day after, it's very important that we be positioned as this indigenous, uh, a member 3,700 years old of an Arab Muslim majority Middle East. That they have told us that they are they are waiting for this new dialogue. That's why we're establishing this uh, Arab Farsi and English Communication Center. Please help us support us in this. Uh, you can do that by um, e emailing us, uh, be getting in touch with us at diker, D I K E R J C P A dot org. We'll direct you to the right uh, to the right uh, people and, and take whatever it is, whether it's eighteen dollars, one hundred eighty dollars, or eighteen hundred dollars, one hundred eighty thousand dollars. We'll take we'll take your gifts and we will apply it to this network and uh, to the many journalists that are working uh, with us uh, in the Arab world. And it's uh, I think uh, a really a, a very important initiative. You think too? We had yeah. Happy, yeah. Extremely important. So we're going to let you go now. We don't want to keep you. Uh, you're starting your morning. And thank you for starting the morning with us. Join us tomorrow at the same time, 9 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time uh, or 6 o'clock in the morning in California, 2 o'clock in the afternoon in London. Uh, this is uh, Lieutenant Khaled Abotwame, Lieutenant Colonel Maurice Hirsch, and myself, Dan Dyker. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and I, Dan Dyker, thank you very much for joining us at the JCPA a Daily Briefing Analysis Assessment, creating context perspective for a very, very complex